Um, for our next panel, we're going to take a look outside of D.C. and uh, compare how the U.S. is doing to some of the other countries in terms of digital government. You may not know this, but one of the most digitally forward countries in the world is Estonia. And I know at Government Executive, we've covered a number of different areas of Estonia's innovation, from providing citizen services to cybersecurity. Uh, of course, Estonia is one of our NATO allies, and so we exchange a lot of uh, national security priorities, uh, share a lot of national security priorities. And so uh, for our next panel, we're going to take a look at what they're doing and also have the Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer here. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the Honorable Eric Marme, who's the Estonian Ambassador to the United States, Corey Zarek, who's the Deputy United States Chief Technology Officer, and our moderator today is Camille Tutti, the Executive Editor of NextGov. Please join me in welcoming them today. Thank you so much, Tim. So thank you for being here today. I really look forward to this conversation because I think it's really important to look globally to see what other governments are doing in terms of uh, digital government efforts. So uh, we have Eric Marme, who's the Estonian ambassador, and we have Corey Zarek, who's the deputy CTO in the White House. So let's start with you, Ambassador. Give us the elevator pitch of your role and uh, <laughs> what you do, really. Well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this conference and, uh, and uh, inviting me uh, here. I think, uh, really, to talk about what the state of, uh, of digital society in Estonia today, I think we, we need to really go back in time a little bit. Just to remind everybody, Estonia was part of the Soviet Union. We were occupied for 50 years, and uh, in 1991, we regained independence. And uh, we were, Estonia was a kind of a backwards post-Soviet country with uh, little or non-existent uh, financial resources and a very limited human resource. So the country is of a size of 1.3 million. And we had no institutions. We had to start from scratch. And from the very early on, in the early 90s, we had to figure out how do we build our society. And we realized that um, in order to be, um, in order to, to to develop the society, we need to really be innovative and efficient. And we put these two things together. We used um, information technology that was there uh, and invented or started to invent um, uh, digital services. Uh, I think, well, and, and another thing what is important is that the, basically we didn't have any infrastructure at that time, even no landline telephones. But we are in, in a kind of a lucky situation that because we, ha we could skip that part of technology and we, <laughs> we stepped to the next level. And in early 90s, the first thing really was to, we realized that in order to um, digitalize the society, we need to go to the, to the grassroots. So uh, we had a program called Tiger Leap um, um, that was basically an idea of, of putting all Estonian schools online. And that happened by 1997. And we also put all public libraries online and, and um, created so-called Wi-Fi hotspots all over the, uh, the country and the free um, sort of access points to internet. And then very soon, uh, private sector realized that uh, th they, they play an important part here. And then government invited the private sector to contribute to this uh, uh, development. So first thing I think uh, was in 95 when uh, um, there was an effort to um, put taxis online. And it was very successful and then the idea was that we should develop it further and uh, really make or, you know, take an advantage of the information technology and, and take all the services to, uh, um, uh, to the net. 
So in late, 19, uh, in late 90s, we uh, decided to introduce a so-called digital identification. And I have, uh, I have this card with me. It's a regular sort of ID card. Every Estonian citizen has this. And the peculiarity of this is that it has a chip uh, on, the, on the backside. So basically, this gives me an access to all the services that government provides, but also what the private sector provides. So we made, we made it mandatory in 1999, and in the beginning, really, people you know, were kind of very skeptical that you, know, you, you, had, you had this ID card, but what, what can you do with it? But then, soon after, more and more services were put online, and where we are today is basically that um, all government services, except for two, um, are online. And what, what you really can't do online is you can't get married. And, uh, <laughs> Maybe that's and, a good thing. And divorced. <laughs> and uh, another thing is you can't buy or sell property. Then you really have to show up and you know, identify yourself with your signature and, and your face. Everything else is pretty much online. I don't remember really when I was last time when I visited any government office to, you know, interact with my government. Um, so I think we have more than 2,500 services that you can use online today. And, uh, and um, basically, you know, it is limitless. So this is where we are today. Mm -hmm. So, Corey, we are not that advanced in the U.S. federal government, but talk a little bit about your efforts. You work with Megan Smith, who is the U.S. CTO, and you're the deputy CTO. So talk a little bit about what your office ha has been doing lately. Sure. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, we, we don't yet have, we're also not um, in a position to get married online, but um, <laughs> I'll take that back. Um, so. In the U.S. government, we've had teams across our, we have about 100 departments and agencies in the U.S. government. We've had teams in those departments and agencies for years who've been working to build and uh, deliver digital services to the public. Um, this work really has uh, increased and kind of coalesced over the last few years, and our team, uh, the chief technology officers team within the White House, has been a big part of that. Um, the CTO team was new this administration. It first uh, came to be in, um, in 2009 with um, the first U.S. CTO, and we're now, as you mentioned, on, uh, we have Megan Smith, our, our third U.S. CTO. And so each of those chief technology officers has kind of brought a different flavor to the position. And we w have worked a lot on um, policies that can help to um, give us the roadmap we need to deliver better digital services. We've worked on opening up data and making more information and um, available to the public, to innovators, to others, to actually help us build these digital services. And then, as I mentioned, just in the last few years, we've uh, really s sort of come together and increased our uh, digital government capacity through a, a few different methods. Um, first started really with uh, an experiment in 2012 called the Presidential Innovation Fellows. So the Presidential Innovation Fellows uh, was an idea that if we have all these amazing, talented people in government and all these amazing, talented people outside of government, what would happen if we put them together? And so we started a, a pilot to bring in entrepreneurs and residents to come and sit in the agencies and actually work alongside our government colleagues to think about how we could um, bring some of the best practices from the private sector uh, into government. And uh, that has worked incredibly well. In the last four years, we've had more than 100 presidential innovation fellows. It's a pretty competitive process to get in. And what we learned from that uh, experiment is that not only should we keep this going, but we need to find ways for individuals like this to come and serve in their government. Uh, more than 50% of the presidential innovation fellows have actually stayed and worked in the US government past the time of their fellowship. So some of those fellows uh, launched 18F, 18F, which is a new digital service, newish digital service delivery team out of the General Services Administration. So in 2014, 
18F uh, launched with a handful of staff and is now up to a couple hundred um, individuals who are sitting within GSA and working with federal agencies to uh, build and deliver digital services, everything from better websites to helping them come up with open data platforms. We've got some great examples. They've been doing um, incredible work with the Federal Election Commission, opening up a lot of that data and making it easier to find and use. Um, they developed a platform for the extractive industry so we can better track the, the revenues received for natural resources in the United States. So they're working with agency teams all across the government to help them deliver on their missions um, better, faster, and cheaper. Another team that came out of this was the U.S. Digital Service. So that was around the same time in 2014, the U.S. Digital Service launched, um, again with some alums of this uh, digital service work, and is also now up to about 200 individuals in government um, who have embedded uh, in agencies to start digital service teams there, such as at the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, Justice, Education, um, elsewhere, and also within the White House, where they're working on some of the, the biggest and, and hardest problems and challenges we're facing in government. So we've got all these great colleagues coming into government, and attracting that talent has been part of this work. But um, as I mentioned at the start, we have incredible colleagues who've already been in government doing this work, and the goal has been to put them together to continue to advance some of these efforts. Mm -hmm. So, Ambassador, I want to get back to Estonia. <clears throat> so you mentioned that when you were building this digital society, you had no other nation to look to, really. You started from scratch. I want to know what were those what were some of the biggest challenges you met and how did you overcome them? Well, I think with the digital sort of uh, um, society or e-governance um, um, comes also uh, an important issue, which is security and safety of, of the, uh, of the uh, of the uh, system. So I think that was the biggest challenge from the beginning, how to make sure that the system really is uh, bulletproof. And uh, if you recall, Estonia actually suffered the first uh, cyber attack um, in the world in 2007, uh, which was politically motivated. And um, the, it was a rather simplistic DDoS attack. Um, but we had to really shut the whole country um, from the outside uh, sort of traffic. And then we realized that um, in order to really make the, uh, the system safe, you, ne you need governmental and private uh, cooperation. And I think one of the fundamentals uh, with this system we have is that uh, is the PPP is, um, was kind of developed after that and the whole of government approach to the security of the, of the uh, um, digital system. Um, we created the system called X-Road. So we don't have a single big database, which government owned, but small databases that interconnect to each other. And the system is based on the on the principle that only you or the owner of your identification uh, can have access to the information. So there is no government access to the information, no backdoors. Only if you give that information by your own consent to the government, then they, they can use uh, the data uh, that is in the system. So this is very important, and I know, you know the big brother issue um, um, in this country, but also in, uh, in, in some other Western European countries is very important. But the same way, this, this is called little sister issue, which is that, you know, smaller companies who would like to sell your data cannot have access to your, uh, Third to your parties. database. Third parties. So this is, uh, this is really uh, important. And also, we created a system where Basically, if somebody wants to have an access to your data, that person, if it's government office, gets flagged. So you see who is approaching or is trying to get your data, and uh, only you have the access. And then you, you call up the police and ask, why, why did you check on my data? 
and if there is no good reason, that policeman will be fired the next day. It has happened with, uh, in few cases with the, uh, the health care system because we have a digital health system. It's all online, it's all uh, connected. We have e-prescriptions. I know in the United States about 5,000 people die because of bad handwriting of, uh, of doctors every year. So this is in Estonia can't happen because you have all the pres prescrip prescriptions online and you can access any pharmacy anywhere in the country and get your prescription uh, with your ID card. So that was really a big challenge, how you, how you create the system that, uh, that is safe and secure. Today, all the system is, 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 uh, uh, in, is encrypted at the highest level. Um, it's the 2048-bit um, uh, encryption. Uh, and we really can say today that the system is safe and secure. We, we, we know that there are attempts to penetrate the system, but uh, there have been no successful attempts. Also, as we have online voting in Estonia, which means that with this ID card you can vote at home online. Uh, that means that they, the, the election system, which is part of that system, has to be really safe and secure as well. Um, we've had 10 e-elections since 2005. We have not a single case of uh, um, uh, malpractice of that system. And during the last elections in 2014, uh, um, uh, about one third of the electorate voted online on a very safe and secure uh, uh, environment. So, Corey, um, you and your office or your, you and your team are obviously concerned about security. What are some of the other challenges that you're trying to so, so, uh, overcome? Yeah, so um, indeed, and we have a great um, kind of partner team, uh, the Chief Information Officer's Office, which actually is really leading in the government on um, privacy and security and some of those other issues. So they develop the policies and guidance and procedures. That office is um, within the Office of Management and Budget, so a different part of the White House. So we work very closely with the, that team, um, and they are doing incredible work to, to lead on this, and including actually um, thinking about how we can move forward on authentication and um, being able to catch up to our Estonian colleagues and others. Um, you know, one thing I should have mentioned in kind of giving the landscape of what we're doing in, in digital gov in, in the U.S. government is that um, since we're really coming together here just in the last few years to focus on this more robustly, we've had the great uh, benefit of getting to learn from our colleagues in Estonia and elsewhere who have charted this course before us. And so um, we've had some very close uh, relationships with some of these digital teams across the globe. And that has been um, not only a great way for us to kind of learn and um, take some of their best practices and avoid some of the landmines, um, but also to collaborate together to solve some of our shared um, issues that we're all facing. So um, our Estonian colleagues have come to sit with our digital teams a few times over the last couple of years. We've also had this um, incredible partnership with the UK Government Digital Service, where we have sent um, teams over to sit with them and learn from them and vice versa. So they've come over to um, work alongside our teams as well on some of the shared issues that we're and addressing. And those two teams share uh, code as well. They do. And so a lot of the work that we're doing um, is open source. And we, uh, the federal government put out a federal source code policy earlier this year to encourage our agencies to continue developing source code in the open so that we can use and reuse this code, this custom code that's being um, developed for, for the federal government at taxpayers' expense. And so when, um, when we open source our code, it's open. So anyone can, can take it and use it, and we, uh, we love when they do. So, um, so in addition to some of these kind of back and forth one-offs with other countries, we've also um, had some great opportunities to do uh, kind of multilateral exchanges with multiple <coughs> governments working uh, to advance their digital government work. And uh, one place this has, has happened is through the Global Open Government Partnership, which is now up to 70 countries uh, who meet regularly to advance open government issues, so the traditional transparency, accountability, um, citizen engagement work, but also digital government. 
There's an entire technology innovation and digital government civic tech track to the Open Government Partnership. So all of our techies and digital govies around the world are coming together through that to um, meet and collaborate. Um, in fact, the Open Government Partnership has its uh, big summit, uh, the Global Summit, next week in Paris, where digital colleagues will come together for a three-day hackathon to come up with open source tools that can be um, shared and adapted across any government who chooses to use them. So there are a lot of um, really interesting ways that we've been working together with uh, colleagues around the globe to, um, to address some of our challenges that we're facing, to advance some of our goals, and to kind of help one another. So when you're working with these other nations, what are some of the areas in the U.S. federal government that you see, especially in digital government, that you see needs more improvement and more work? So I think we can look at this two ways. There's sort of just the process and how, you know, I mentioned that we're a little bit behind some of these countries like Estonia and the UK and others who've gotten a little bit ahead of us. And so we're able to learn a lot from them just on the process front. You know, how did you do it? Um, what should we avoid? Where should we go next? Um, and then there's also the substance. So some of the actual um, uh, program areas that we have um, gotten involved in. So France has um, successfully opened up all of its address data. Sometimes it can be challenging for, say, um, an emergency rescue worker to find the actual um, physical location where a building is or a place that they need to get to, uh, for example. And so to open up address data will allow um, innovation on um, better finding buildings, locations, residences elsewhere, um, and, and keeping track of places that have um, become vacant and things like that. So France has figured this out and opened up all of their address data, and our um, government agencies are working with them to learn a little bit from that. So the Department of Transportation, um, Consumer, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and some others have been um, collaborating with the French team on that. In fact, that's one of the, the work streams at this hackathon that will take place next week to kind of continue building and advancing um, tools and effort along those lines. So we're really working together and learning in, in kind of both the the you know, high level 30,000 foot way and also kind of down in the weeds on the different um, projects and goals that our agencies are trying to advance. Mm -hmm. If I may just jump in uh, to this, I think the, the cooperation, bilateral cooperation and multilateral cooperation, uh, especially amongst the allies, uh, is uh, of cru cru crucial importance and uh, very important because we are facing more and more uh, um, um, threats in the cyberspace and um, and real attacks and then in order to make sure that that critical infrastructure is safe and that um, um, we share information uh, between the allies um, in order to fight the bad guys it is it is really important to have uh, both bilateral level exercises uh, but also in NATO, uh, in European Union in our case, which uh, Estonia is a member of. And we have really good experience with the United States in this. And, uh, and um, it is continuous and, and, and uh, really kind of adds value to uh, what we do in our society to make sure that, uh, that cyberspace is safe and secure uh, and bring it to the, uh, to the international level. We also host this so-called NATO Center of Excellence, Cyber Center of Excellence in Estonia. And also uh, we host the European Union um, Information Technology Database in Estonia. So there is a lot of interaction between the allies and, and, and partners in this field. Mm -hmm. I want to open up the floor to questions. Hi, my question is for Corey. Um, so you mentioned that the CTO's office and services like the USDS are new in this administration. Knowing that we're going through a transition now, do you know anything about the future of those services and what's being done to educate the new administration about what's been done? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question and very um, important and obviously timely. Um, so uh, the, the the thing um, that's important to note about um, this work is that even though a lot of it has really come together um, more robustly in the last few years, it's been going on for a very long time. So we have longstanding colleagues and agencies who've been leading on digital service delivery for decades. And they will still be there 
um, in January and beyond. And the teams at the General Services Administration, where the Presidential Innovation Fellows sit and where 18F sits, um, those programs will also continue moving forward. A lot of the colleagues at the General Services Administration are career civil servants um, and will keep coming to work and delivering digital services on behalf of the American people. And, um, and same with the US Digital Service. So while that was a, a team that, it, that started at the White House, they have um, embedded teams within several agencies. And many of those colleagues are actually agency employees, just like anyone else. And our colleagues at the White House, um, many of them came under, uh, under a sort of tour of duty, tour of service model, where they're on a hiring authority that's for a set number of years, um, as opposed to, say, a political appointment. So many, um, you'll, you'll keep seeing us around. Many of us will still be here and continuing to do this work and carry it forward. And that's, um, you know, I think when we think about digital service delivery and improving the tech landscape in government and collaborating with colleagues all around the world and elsewhere, it's important work that needs to continue and, and we'll continue to support that how best we can. Um, but I should also say that, you know, we will, um, we can't speculate on what a new administration and what their priorities will be and, and what they'll bring with them. And so we'll, uh, we'll be here and we'll be ready to, to catch and, and help transition the new team as they come aboard. Good morning, Katiuska Tapia from DHS. Just uh, interested in learning a little bit more about Estonia's uh, ID uh, identification that you have. Uh, do you also include immigration status or do you provide additional um, secure documents that relates to their immigration status? To what status? To what status? Uh, immigration. Immigra For immigration. You can also touch on the e-residency okay. program as well. Right. Um, yes. Um, as I said, the ID card is mandatory to all Estonian um, residents. That means, you know, citizens and non-citizens who have permanent residency in, in Estonia have, uh, have ID card. Um, it, it, it gives the same services. Um, it does not involve immigration issues. This is, this is different. I mean, you, you, in order to get an Estonian ID card, you really need to be um, you know, either resident or non-resident uh, um, of the country. But what we have developed now, uh, this is exactly two years ago, we came up with an idea of, of so-called e-residency, which is open for all the people across the world. And the Japanese that, Prime Minister is an e-resident. She is indeed. Uh, there are other uh, high-level dig digni dignitaries <laughs> who are. Uh, and uh, so the idea is that basically it doesn't provide or give you a Estonian citizenship, but it gives you all the same rights to use the Estonian uh, digital services or e-services e that the residents who have e-identity uh, e cards in Estonia have. So basically, you don't need to, for instance, and Estonia's member of the European Union, you don't need to really travel to, to, to any place in European Union to open your business. You can, if you are a resident, you can do that through that system. Uh, we are sort of in a de developing phase of that, the same way like we did with our own national ID cards when when it was introduced in 99, I said, you know, people were very skeptical what to do with it. Today, there is nobody who, who would say that there is a, that the card or the system is useless. So we are developing the e-residency system the same way that, you know, we, we get private sector uh, to be part of that system and uh, the banks. So it's, it's very important to have the, the access to the banks on a secure and safe way. And uh, the idea is that we could grow the virtual citizenry uh, of Estonia without these people being actual Estonian citizens. But they can open their businesses and, and create value to, to, uh, to their own businesses, but also to Estonian economy. Um, so I think we have, as of today, about uh, 20,000 e-residents all over the world. I think in 128 countries, a lot uh, from the United States as well. 
And there is, uh, I think, this is what I hear, is that the uh, UK citizens are very interested of e residency now. When after Brexit. After the, after the Brexit, <laughs> that, you know, if, the, if you want to keep your business in European Union, that, that would be the easiest way to do it, to apply for Estonian e residency and, uh, and uh, keep on going. Maybe that's uh, uh, an idea that uh, the U.S. government can also implement in the future. Well, we're out of time, but thank you so much to Eric and Corey. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you.